Praise the Lord. Rise up as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study. Thank you for bringing us together once again. Thank you for your love, for your mercy, for your compassion. Thank you for your plan, for the church, for your own children. Lord, we pray that every one of us will be at the very center of your will in Jesus' name. So that, Lord, where your plan comes out to fruition, we'll be part of that fulfillment of the plan in Jesus' name. Once again, Lord, we pray that as we hear the word today, we'll not be hearers of the word alone, we'll be doers of the word as well in Jesus' name. That your grace will be abundant in our lives. And then your strength and power to live a life befitting the children of God, saintly, sanctified, holy lives, purified lives, grant unto us in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can sit down. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And today we're looking at verse 10 in particular. That happens to be the conclusion of this chapter 1. As we look at chapter 1 from verse 1, we think about the servants of the Lord who came to bring the word, the gospel, the good news, the glad tidings, the word of salvation, the word of freedom from sin. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior, unto the people of Thessalonica. And some people responded. And because of that, the apostle Paul, or Silas, and Timothy give thanks for them. Because these people, they actually had the word of God. And the word of God had impact in their lives. A great influence in their lives turned them around and made them transform people, triumphant people, transparent people. And because of that, he then noted what had happened to them. Look at verse 3, remembering, without ceasing your work of faith and the labor of love and the patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. Here Paul the Apostle praised the Lord for them. He said, there is a conversion that has taken place, a transformation that has taken place, a turning around taking place in their lives. And it was not just a superficial sin, an external sin, affecting only their outlook and their outward appearance and their dressing and, you know, their ear due or whatever. It affected their heart. And coming from the very source of their lives, there are these three things manifested for them. Number one, the work of faith. The faith worked in them, and the faith produced a new life in them. Number two, the labor of love. They now began to serve one another in love, forgetting themselves and just remembering the needs of other people. Number three, it gave them the hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, the patience, perseverance in their hope. And then Paul the Apostle said there's something he knew. He knew about their choice. He knew about their selection. He knew about their election. In verse 4, knowing brethren, beloved, your election of God, your selection of God, your choice of God. Many are called, but few are chosen. And by the very repentance who have manifested the righteous life you live, and because you live such a life that glorifies the Lord, I can tell that your name is in the book of life. I can tell that you are elected and selected and chosen. Then he now wanted to recap and wanted to remind them how the gospel came to them. It came not just in word. It came not just by verbal declaration. It came with real power. It came with pungency. It came with real pointed attention in the hearts of the people. Look at verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you. In watch only. There are some people that all they have is the word only. All they have is the letter only. All they have is the doctrine only. It doesn't penetrate their heart. Penetrate their personality. But says Paul, the apostle says, the word of God did not come to you. Just in the mental ascent. Just affect. Affecting your emotion, affecting your head. It's not just instruction. 
it came also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. And in these people, their lives turned around so much that these pagans, heathens, idol worshippers in the past, they now became real children of God and they manifested the real life of the Christian because now it says in verse 6, and you became followers of us and of the Lord. They were just walking step by step and day after day and moment after moment in the life of Christ. And anything that happened to them, temptation came, trial came, persecution came, suffering came, they'll ask themselves, what will the Lord do? How will Paul approach this? How will Timothy live through this? How will Silas live through this? And they became followers of the apostles and followers of those preachers of the gospel and followers of the Lord as well. Their lives are totally turned around. It says, having received the word in much affliction and with joy of the Holy Ghost, they did not allow the affliction, the persecution, the pain to cancel the joy of the Lord in their lives. Not only that, as these people were emulating the apostles of the Lord and disciples of the Lord, they became people too that we could follow, that we could emulate, that we could also follow the pattern of their lives. That's why it says in verse 7, so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith, your God word, is spread abroad so that we need not speak speak anything. Paul the apostle said, your life has demonstrated the gospel, has spread the gospel, is preaching the gospel, is making the people know there is power in the gospel, transforming power in the gospel. There is a kind of power that changes life that you find in the gospel. And then it says, everywhere we went, Macedonia, Achaia, every other place, as we look at the people and we say, how did you hear the gospel? Who came here to preach to you? And then they told us that the life that those that are believers lived, it just turned us around. We began to ask questions. How did this happen to you? How did you change? How were you converted? And he began to tell us, this is the way, and we followed the way as well. And Paul the Apostle was so grateful to God that the lives of these people had actually spread the gospel and preached the gospel to all the people. It says in verse 9, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering we add unto you. How that he turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And it says that you know when, when we got over there macedonia Achaia, every other place they were showing us that yes we know what you are bringing the message of repentance the message of faith in christ and the message of righteousness in the lord and the message that when you believe on the lord jesus christ your life will change that if you come to christ if any man be in christ he is a new creature old things pass away and all things become new and they showed us that you in particular, it is Nika, that you turned away from your idols, you abandoned your idols, and all those uh, kind of occultic books, idolatrous materials, you brought everything together, you burnt them, and now they said there's just one thing you have, it's expectation for the coming of the Lord, in verse 10, and that you now wait for your son, from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. They said they have been delivered from the wrath to come so that they will partake in the glory of the Lord. They partake in the greatness of what the Lord is bringing when he comes. And because of that expectation that the glory of God was coming upon them because of that expectation that when he comes, all their sorrows will pass away, all their sufferings will pass away, all the trials will pass away, all their struggles will pass away. They were not waiting. They said, Lord, we're waiting for you. The next event we're waiting for, imminent, very near, very soon, is that, Lord, you'll come, come, Lord Jesus. We're waiting. And that's why it says they were waiting for the Son of God. 
to be revealed from heaven. This is the son of God that died and was buried and then rose again for justification because the mighty power of God raised him up and now he has saved us too from the wrath to come. About the coming of the Lord, look at your scriptures in Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. What do you read from verse 9? Acts chapter 1 verse 9. It says, and when he has spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus the one who died for your sins. The same Jesus, the one who was buried. This same Jesus, the one who rose from the dead on the third day. The same Jesus, the one who appeared unto you. My many infallible proofs all these 40 days and now it's gone up. This same Jesus, the ascended Lord. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven heaven. Then they were now thinking oh, what will it take for you to be able to see the Lord when he comes? What will it take for you to be able to partake in that glory when he comes? Then they remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ what he had told them. Those who will see the Lord when he comes again. Matthew chapter 5. I'm looking at verse 8. Matthew chapter 5 verse 8. It says blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. They now remember that as the Lord is coming back and the angels assured them that this same Jesus is coming again. If you are going to see him, the Lord of glory, the God of all grace, if you're going to see him, you must be pure in heart. How can that happen? Number one, you must have been pardoned from all your sins. You realize you're a sinner and that by yourself, you cannot save yourself. That it takes the grace of the Lord, the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb to change your life and to turn you around. And then one, your sins are forgiven. All the external sins you have committed, all the things you have said wrong, all the things you have done wrong, everything gone. Pardon for sin. Number two, purity of heart. That the Lord now reaches out into your heart and it gets rid of that Adamic nature, that depravity, that carnality, that thing that you are born with and it purifies you and it cleanses you from within. And then it's only then that you are waiting for the coming of the Lord, getting ready. That's why it says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Hebrews chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 14. As these people now, they recollected, they remembered, they recalled what the angels had said, that this same Jesus is coming again, and they had the desire to see him, and they had the passion to see him, and they knew that if they were going to see the Lord, they will not see the Lord if your life is still dirty, if your life is still sinful, if your life is still defiled, if you have not been born again, that's why they were waiting. They were waiting in righteousness. They were waiting in sanctification and holiness. They were waiting in the, the purity of heart. Because it says in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 14, For look peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And because of that desire in them, they just they were waiting, saying, Oh Lord, whatever impurity is still there, whatever imperfection is still there, whatever evil is still there, cleanse everything away. Take everything away so that we'll be ready for the coming of the Lord. And as we come to study about these thousand believers, and you see what we're studying is so that we too can be like them, that you will be very, very sure beyond any shadow of doubt that you have been born again. Because if you are not born again, you will not see the Lord. And you will be very, very sure beyond any shadow of doubt that after you are saved, you are also sanctified. You are purified. You are made holy. The blood of Jesus washes you and makes you whiter than snow and takes away all unrighteousness from your life. If you have not been born again, you must hurry up and get you being born again. Look at John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 3, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The king is coming. The Lord is coming. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, he is coming. But except you are born again, 
That's the beginning. That's the starting point. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the king or the kingdom or the Lord. Look at verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. When he comes, he's going to take his own people, the saints, not the sinners, the purified, not the polluted, the righteous, not the righteous, is going to take those righteous people, those saintly people, those purified people, those sanctified people. It's going to take them out of this world and it's going to take them into the kingdom and we enter with him. That's why we're seeing when the saints go marching in, Lord, count me among the number. I pray the Lord will count you among the number. If you are born again, if you are born again, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Except a man be born of water, the water of the word, and of the spirit, that cleansing spirit and that sanctifying spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And that's why the people now, they said, yes, we understand. We want to see the Lord. And are waiting, full of expectation that the Lord himself will get them ready for that day. I pray he'll get you ready in Jesus' name. And now in First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. First Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10 it says and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come these Thessalonian believers Christians were genuinely converted and both their inward passion and outward expression of life testified to the experience of salvation and as they have repented of their sins and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, as Lord, their lives were transformed. The passion of their lives has been summed up in this one single verse I read unto you. It reveals, number one, the decision they have made. It reveals, number two, the direction of their lives. Now, it reveals, number three, the devotion of their lives. It reveals, number four, the destiny of their lives. Number one, the decision. They're taking a decision. They are going to abandon their idols, repent of all their sins, call upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Number two, they were not following the direction, walking the narrow path that leads to glory, that leads to heaven. Number three, now they are devotion. They were devoted to the Lord, consecrated unto the Lord, separated from the world and separated unto the Lord. And then number four, the destiny, the outcome of that, the outcome of that decision, the outcome of that direction, the outcome of that devotion bringing them to the destiny of their lives that they live a focused life and a purposeful life and their consecration or dedication is thus revealed in this verse 10 number one their preparation and perseverance to wait for to wait for that's the preparation lord we're waiting and we're not just waiting idleness they were waiting checking up their lives examining their lives are we ready or are we not ready then number two the prince of peace is son they were not waiting for an angel to come no they were not waiting for saint so and so saint so, such and such to come they were waiting for just this personality from heaven that is the very son of God, the prince of peace, number three, the priceless place. They knew that this place is coming from, is coming from heaven. And that was the place they prized most in their lives. They said, whatever we miss in this world and whatever glory, whatever joy, whatever enjoyment, whatever pleasure we miss in this world, we're waiting for that one to come from heaven, that priceless place to take us to heaven, the priceless place. Number four is the a pledge whom he raised from the dead that's the pledge that's the thing that gives us assurance that since he raised him from the dead the lord means to complete the whole cycle he was born he lived the life he was betrayed and then he died and was buried he rose again he's ascended up to heaven but he has his own disciples here he's going coming to take us the cycle must be completed as he has given us that pledge he raised him from the dead number five is the propitiation even jesus the one who died 
Even Jesus, the Lamb. Even Jesus, a substitute. Even Jesus, the one who cleanses all our sins away. The propitiation, number six, is the provision and the and a privilege. His provision and a privilege. What's his provision? He delivered us. He delivered us from what? That's from number seven, the perpetual punishment and perdition from the wrath to come. This is why they lived a life of sincerity, a life of separation, a life of sacrifice, a life of soul winning, a life of service, a life of sanctification, a life of selflessness. Those people in Thessalonica, they just, they decided, I'm not going to miss the rapture when it takes place. I'm not going to miss the coming of the Lord when the Lord comes. And because of that, they kind of dedicated themselves, addicted themselves, consecrated themselves to number one, a life of sincerity. No hypocrisy, no insincerity. No double play, no gambling, no game, just sincerity. Number two, a life of separation. They separated themselves from the idol worship of the land and from all the practices of the past. Number three, a life of sacrifice. They said, nothing is too good to sacrifice. Nothing is too great and too big to give up just to gain the, the privilege of seeing the Lord when he comes. And then number four is the life of soul winning. Everywhere they went, they were speaking the word and spreading the word and preaching the word of the gospel. Number five, a life of service. Serving the Lord and serving one another in the love of God. Number six, a life of sanctification. A life of in what purity, in what holiness, in what sanctification. A life that the Lord will look at and will be pleasing unto the Lord. Not something shallow, superficial. There are people that will say they are living a holy life but it's all outward. It's all external. It is all superficial. Their thoughts are dirty. Their minds are dirty. Their disposition is dirty. Their attitude, dirty. Everything within them, dirty. But in the case of these people, because they knew that flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God, that it was the inner man, the spirit man. It was the, the inward man in them that will actually make it at the rapture. That's the reason why they lived inward holiness and purity and sanctification. And then, number seven, a life of selflessness. They were not doing anything thing for selfish purposes and they were looking up and looking forward waiting patiently in the patience of hope they were looking for the glorious appearing of our lord and savior jesus christ in their work of faith in their labor of love they were evangelizing the laws in that work of faith and that labor of love they were laboring for the conversion of sinners while living for god's glory and waiting for the rapture I pray that all of us will be like them in Jesus' name. So that when the Lord will come, they and us and everyone that has come to know the Lord through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, uh, they and we and them will be ready for the coming of the Lord in Jesus' name. As we look at the study tonight, which is preparation and readiness for Christ's return. Preparation and readiness for Christ's return. Whatever I need the message, they study to three parts. Number one, waiting for Christ's imminent return. That's what imminent means very soon. Could be any time, could be any moment. And we're waiting, expecting Christ's imminent return. Number two, the wonders of Christ's indisputable resurrection. That's what indisputable means. You cannot dispute it. You cannot debate it. You cannot question it. You cannot kind of doubt it. Indisputable, undoubtable. Indisputable resurrection. The wonders of it. What it does for you, what it does for me, what it does for us, what it did for them. And what it does for people today. And when you believe in that Jesus Christ that was raised from the dead, the power that raised him from the dead, the power of resurrection will come in your life and walk in your life and transform you through and through spirit, soul, and body. And make you to live the overcoming life. The wonders of Christ's indisputable resurrection. Number three, watchfulness and deliverance from impending wrath. Watchfulness and deliverance from the wrath to come. Coming upon the children of disobedience, the wrath at the time of the great tribulation, and the wrath that comes upon unbelievers all throughout eternity. Watchfulness and deliverance from impending wrath. Number one, waiting for Christ's 
imminent return. We come to First Thessalonians chapter one, verse ten. First Thessalonians chapter one, and we're looking at verse ten. It says in verse ten to and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. It says the one we're waiting for. We didn't see. We just believed on Him. And then he just took the wrath and the judgment away. And he took the guilt and the condemnation away. And we're saying, oh Lord, we want to see you. have been so good to us and so gracious to us and so wonderful to us. Wouldn't it be a, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing to see this Christ as Savior, as substitute, the one that bore all our punishment and the one that bore all our guilt. Wouldn't it be wonderful to see him face to face? That's why they were eager. That's why you too should be eager watching to see that one who has delivered you from the wrath to come. By the way, it wasn't only the Thessalonian believers that were waiting. All the other believers at that time who had come to know the Lord. That same great expectation was in their hearts. And they were all waiting to see him. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I'm reading there from verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 7. So that ye come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. As you look at that verse, it says, you Corinthian people, you have not come behind in receiving all the gifts of the Spirit. But he said, we don't want to just stay with the gift. We want to see the giver. He's giving us so much. He gave us salvation. We want to see that giver. He gave us sanctification, holiness of heart, purity of heart, I want to see that giver. He gave us the baptism in the Holy Ghost and just poured the Spirit upon us over and over until we overflowed. I want to see that giver. He gave us the gifts of the Spirit. A gift of the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom and the sender of spirit. And he gave us the working of miracles and the, and the spirit of faith. And he also gave us, uh, you know, the, all the working of miracles and the healing. He gave us the prophecy and the speaking in tongues and everything and interpretation. He's given us great, great gifts and the Corinthian church said yes we know if you compare our church with any other church we have not come behind of any of those churches in any gift but we want to see the giver that's why it says they were waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in Second Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 5 Second Thessalonians chapter 3 we're looking at verse 5 waiting and waiting and waiting as they were waiting in First Thessalonians in Second Thessalonians they continued waiting and the Lord directs your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ why patient well because you know sometimes when persecution is so much upon the believer. The, the believer is saying, oh Lord, this position is so much. The pressure is so much. The pain is so much. The difficulties are so much. And the mountain we have to climb and the rivers we have to cross and the responsibilities of the day, they look very heavy on us. Why don't you come now? Why don't you come now? But the Lord made these believers in Tesnaika to be patient in the in tribulation, patient in their trial, patient in their temptations. And then it says, they were now patiently waiting for Christ. I pray that God will give us that patience too. So that you'll not just be in a hurry, oh Lord, come now, come now. Temptation's too much, pressure too much, the pain too much. Don't you know that the longer you endure, the greater your reward will be. When he comes, wait patiently, he will come. I said he will come. In Luke chapter 12, we're looking at it from verse 35. Waiting, 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 the people of God, waiting. Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12 verse, from verse 35. Let your loins be guarded about, and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord. Ye yourselves like unto men that wait. If you, saw, if you see somebody who is waiting for another person, is waiting for a beloved one, is waiting maybe for the bridegroom, is waiting for the husband, or is waiting for the wife, you can tell the way they are, they don't settle down, forget themselves, and sleep off, and then do what the other people are doing. The other people don't have any hope. The other people don't have any expectation. The other people are not waiting for anything or anyone. Therefore, they live anyhow, they talk anyhow, they behave anyhow, they go anywhere, they dress anyhow, they eat anything, they drink anything. But this one is waiting. 
And because he's waiting, like a man, like a woman that is waiting for the bride or the bridegroom, because of that, his mind is there. He said, I must leave, but my mind is awake. Because any time the trumpet can sound, any time the call can come, and I want to be ready, and ye yourselves in verse 36, ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants. I pray you'll be one of those blessed people. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, he shall gird himself and make them sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And let's look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. This waiting that the Thessalonian believers did. Those Thessalonians, they were waiting for God's Son, Jesus Christ from heaven. This implies the possibility of his coming during their lifetime. You know, they just believe that he could come even at that time. And in fact, not only that, he could come at any moment during their lifetime. The imminent return of the Lord Jesus is the believer's hope. It is found in many passages of scripture. In the New Testament, no other prophecy of scripture needs to be fulfilled before the coming of Christ for his people. It is the next great event in God's program that the church is now waiting for. The return of the Son of God from heaven, when truly believed, will lead you, number one, to vigilance and zeal. If you are really waiting, a lot of things are cut away from your life. You just understand that is a non-essential. You just understand that is not important. You just understand that is not significant because I'm waiting. I don't want him to meet me involved in minor things, inconsequential things, unimportant things. Things that will not matter in eternity. When you are waiting for the coming of the Lord, what he does for you is that he leads you to vigilance and zeal. That you are not living with eternity in view. And the things you do are the things that will matter in eternity. Not only that number two, it will also make you, to, it affects your conduct. Affect your conduct, your character. The things you do, you know, it's like when a wife is waiting for her husband. The husband has traveled a long distance. I'm far away and for a long time and now the husband is coming back and she has got information husband is coming activities will change she'll clean up the home she'll clean up herself she'll get ready she'll make herself as pure as beautiful as wonderful as she could be and as the lord jesus christ the bridegroom is coming and the bride is waiting for that bridegroom the husband the head of the church then the church is purifying herself beautifying herself with the beauty of holiness the beauty of purity the beauty of sanctification so that when the bridegroom will come when the husband will come then the wife the bride will be ready i pray you'll be wise to be ready in jesus name not only that number three he'll be seized upon with a great power that is, you have the great power of God, all the provision of the Lord to purify your life, to make your life successful spiritually, to make your life fruitful spiritually. You seize that power. You take that power so that you'll be what he wants you to be. And that coming of the Lord when you're thinking about it, when you're preparing, when you're waiting, it will exert a powerful, practical influence upon your lives too. The Thessalonian believers lived as if they were waiting for his return. They fully believed it and they were looking up, they were looking towards it for it. They expected it, not knowing when it might occur, but knowing it might occur at any moment. They were dead to the world. The things of the world did not attract them. If you come back to the illustration I just gave you now, a wife waiting for the husband. A wife that is waiting for the coming of the husband who has been away for a long time. If there are parties around, I say, lady, would you come to the party? I'm waiting. I'm waiting for my husband. I've not seen him for a long, long time. Let the party go. We're not doing anything bad there. We're just, you know, just going to make merry and eat and drink and just have a nice time. He says, yes, I know. I'm not talking about doing something bad or something naughty, something evil, drunkenness, smoking there. I'm just talking about the fact that I'm waiting for my husband. And I cannot get involved in going to any party now. When you're really waiting, waiting for the coming of the Lord and you know that he can come anytime. There are some things, even innocent things. 
even sinless things, things that are not even sinful, that you say, I cannot get involved with that because I'm waiting for the coming of the Lord. You're going to re-examine your life, re-examine all the activities of your life, re-examine all the involvements you have in your life. And the things that you know will hold you down. The things you know will hold you back. And the things you know will dull your conscience. And the things you know that will make your life insipid, not having enthusiasm, excitement and the fire and the fervency and the readiness for him to come and take you all those things to cast away from your life because of the great expectation that you have you are dead to the world and you'll be motivated with an honest desire to live righteously holily justly in this present life rescuing souls from eternal punishment the prophecy of christ's imminent return will lead us to watchfulness and to an and a self-examination, whether we are prepared, whether we're ready to meet him or not. As we look at Romans chapter 8, we're looking at it from verse 23. Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to which the redemption of the body. We know that when he, work, when he comes, he's going to make a body to resemble his glorious body. And because of that, that's why we're, we're eager to see that. We're eager to have all this body that is corruptible, all this body that is subject to sickness and to death. We want it changed, we want it transformed so that we can be like him when we see him exactly as he is. Look at First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1. Be, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God if we are born again? Now are we the sons of God if we have repented of our sins? Now are we the sons of God if we're new creatures in Christ? Now are we the sons of God if we have the spirit of God bearing witness with our spirit? It's not a mommy that tells you you are born again. It has to be the spirit of God. It's not daddy that's, ah, you are doing well now. I took you, I told you to take that, you took it, you drop that, you dropped it. You are born again. No, it's not daddy that tells you you are born again. It's the spirit of God that bears witness witness with your heart within you giving you the assurance you're born again if the spirit of god has not given that conviction within your heart that you're born again maybe you're not born again yet get go to the lord and have real repentance and go to the lord and have real cleansing from within then you are born again and the spirit of god will say now are you a child of god and it does not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him. That's why we're waiting. That's why we're eager. That's why we're passionate about it. We say we're going to be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And then it says, and every man that has this hope in him. Does what? Tell me out loud. Purifies, purifies, purifies us in the continuous tense. That means, uh, you know, you were saved before, praise the Lord, sanctified before, praise the Lord. But every day, every day, just like you wake up in the morning, you clean up again. You wake up in the morning and you wash your mouth again. You wake up in the morning and then you take your bath again. You're washing, washes himself, washes himself in a continuous tense. In the same way, purifies himself. That means as you wake up in the morning, you say, oh Lord, help me today. I want to live a victorious life. I want to live a righteous life. I want to live a holy life. I want to live an overcoming life. And then you go to the office and things are happening there and here and there. And then you are telling the Lord, Lord, remember me. I prayed in the morning. He purified himself. And when they bring this and they bring that, because you are waiting. After all, the trumpet may sound while you are still in the office there. The trumpet may sound while you are still in the bus there. The trumpet may sound while you are still in the taxi. The trumpet may sound while those people are throwing and throwing 
this for your sake, Lord, purify me. Keep me pure. Keep me holy. Keep me righteous and keep me sanctified. He purifies himself even as he is pure. He says, I'm not satisfied to be like, you know, that man, that woman, that one, that other one. I just want to be like the Lord Jesus Christ so that when he comes, there will be a magnet in him that will also attract the magnet in me. The same holiness in him and then holiness in me attracted together and then taking me up and catch him, taking me up so that I'll be with him. Every man, every church member, every boy, every girl, every man, every woman, every convert, every child of God, every man that has this hope in him, purifies himself even as he is pure. What is he purifying himself from? Look at verse 4. Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. It's making sure that transgression does not stick to its life. Sin does not attach itself to its life. And we know in verse 5 that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. That's what he's checking up every time. Oh Lord, I know in you there is no sin. I want to be like you. I want to live like you. I want to talk like you. I want to comport myself like you and there's no sin in you oh lord purify me continually so that no sin will remain in my life in verse 6 whosoever abideth in him sinneth not oh lord that's my goal that's my desire that's the experience I want to maintain every time so I can be ready for the coming of the lord so that no sin I ever small no sin I ever secret no sin I ever besetting no sin I ever kind of overcoming other people will overcome my life I want to live a pure life a holy life a sanctity life, a life that is ready for the coming of the Lord. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him and cannot see him. The one that is living in sin every time, coming to Bible study, coming to church, going to house fellowship, and going to retreat, and going for conference, congress, everywhere, but every time see committing sin, living in sin, pastor will not know this. Uh, overseer will not see this daddy will not see this mommy will not know this but living in sin you not see the lord he has not even seen the lord and he cannot see the lord when he comes because it says whosoever sinneth has not seen him neither known him little children new converts let no man deceive you he that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous he that committeth sin is of god is what he that committed sin is of deeper life. No, he doesn't even have shallow life. Not to talk of deeper life. He doesn't have spiritual life. He that committed sin, still living in sin, playing with sin, gambling with sin, joking with sin. He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning for this purpose. The Son of God was manifested that he might do what? Destroy, destroy, destroy. He can do it. I said he can do it. Every scene, small, big, minor, major, secret, public, private, constant, occasional, every scene. He destroys the works of the devil. And when you come to the Lord, the blood of Jesus cleanses us. From all sin. That's how to be ready for the coming of the Lord. It says, he that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. That he might destroy. How many works of the devil? Destroy all the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. We're looking at point number two now. Point number two, the wonders of Christ's indisputable resurrection. We're coming back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're looking at verse 10. We're still looking at the good quality of the lives of these Thessalonian believers. How they were waiting for the coming of the Lord with great, great expectation. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. 
That's the assurance he has given us. If he was able to raise him from the dead, then he's going to do every other thing that he said he will do. Like the coming of the Lord again is going to do it. He will do it in Jesus' name. If the return of Christ and the rapture of Christians seem impossible or incredible to unbelievers, we must remember that God has given us a pledge, an assurance in the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. If the return of Christ and the resurrection of the Christians seem unbelievable to the world, the church must remember that our Lord was raised from the dead while the world of Pharisees and Sadducees doubted. That the doubt doesn't mean it's not going to be done. That they say that's unbelievable, that's incredible. How can anybody believe that? That God will raise the dead, and then we which are alive, you will be caught up together with them to be with the Lord in the air. How is that possible? That's what they said. When he said he was going to rise again, destroy this temple, referring to his body. On the third day, I'll raise it up again. That's what is how can that be? How can he do that? And then when he died, when they buried him, they said, roll the stone there and seal it up. So that his disciples not come to steal him away and then tell us that he's risen from the dead. And then the last error will be greater than the first error. They didn't believe it, but even though they doubted, the Lord still did it. And the Lord is telling us today that even though there are people that may not believe in the, re in the rapture and the resurrection of the dead, as the Lord has said, so shall it be in Jesus' name. The conception of Christ by a virgin seemed unbelievable when I saw predicted it but it happened not only that the virgin birth seemed impossible when the angel announced it but it happened and his resurrection seemed inconceivable when Christ proclaimed it and yet it happened all these things came to pass by the supernatural power of God and this same thing we're told now that this same Jesus whom he raised from the dead which is taken off from you unto heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven even though the people of the world may doubt it yet it is going to happen in Acts of the Apostles chapter 17 I'm reading from verse 1 Acts of the Apostles chapter 17 verse 1 now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia. They came to Thessalonica. Where was the synagogue of the Jews? And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them. And three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. That's what they heard. That's what they learned. That's what they were instructed in. That's the message of the gospel that he had about the coming, about the sacrifice of Jesus, about the death of Jesus, and about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is the Christ. And some of them believed and agreed and associated and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the devout Greeks, a, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. He reminded them, you believe in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you are saved. That in fact is the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 1, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. This is the gospel. The death of Christ for our sins, the shedding of his blood for our sins, the cleansing, taking away our sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. And the rising up again for justification, for purification. That is the gospel. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. I pray you'll not believe in vain. There are people that believe in vain. They only believe healing, no salvation. They only believe success, no salvation. They only believe, answered prayer, take my sickness away, take my bad luck away, take uh, evil spirit away, take this away, no salvation. And they say, I believe, I believe, I believe in Jesus, body healed, soul lost. 
They believe in vain. I pray you not believe in vain. Not to believe in vain, you have to be born again. Cleansed, washed, all your sins taken away. That's the real thing. And that is what Jesus Christ came to do. That you'll not just believe, I believe in miracle, I believe God providing this, God providing that. All those things will pass away. What shall it profit a man? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his very soul, what can man give in exchange for his soul? If you're not going to believe in vain, you'll be born again. Look at it in verse 3 now. For I delivered unto you first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He rose again the third day. And it is when you believe that, that now you are saved, you are born again. Look at verse 14. In verse 14 it says, And if Christ be, be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith also is vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. If the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain and ye are yet in your sins. The wonder of his resurrection is that he saves us from our sins because of that resurrection. By believing on the Lord Jesus Christ who was raised from the dead, that same power of resurrection works in our lives. And we're able to say, because he rose from the dead, we too were risen with him. In fact, you have to believe that resurrection before you can be born again. Look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 9 and verse 10. This is very important, very important. You see, there are people that say, I believe in Jesus. When well, you question them, what do you believe in about Jesus? I believe that he's a great man of God. I believe he's a great prophet. I believe that he opened the eyes of the blind. I believe he can heal the sick. That doesn't save you, my friend. That you believe that Jesus is a great miracle worker. That doesn't save anybody. That you believe he can heal my body. That doesn't save anybody. He can provide food for me when I'm hungry. That doesn't save anybody. What do you believe? On the Lord about Jesus that gets you saved. Look at Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's why you find a lot of people, thousands or millions of people. And they go to all these, uh, you know, camp meetings and conventions and retreats and places. And they say, because I believe in Jesus. What do you believe? I believe he will heal me. I believe he'll do this for me. I believe he'll give me success. I believe he'll give me victory. I believe he'll give me this and I believe he'll deliver me. That's not what saves. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, not unto healing, not to provision, not to success, not to getting a wife, not to getting children. All those things are good, but it won't take you to heaven. If you have a hundred children, it doesn't take you to heaven. You have a good wife, loving wife that can cook well. The home making very well. That doesn't take you to heaven. What takes you to heaven is that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Saves your soul. Forgives your sin. Turns your life around. Changes your life. Transforms you. And you become victorious over sin. And see, I used to be overcome. Conquered by sin. But now I have the victory. That's what saves. For the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto what? Unto salvation. And that's why it's very important that you have that glorious hope in you. First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. 
I'm reading there from verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope. He has begotten us. We are born again. How are we born again? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's what it does. When you believe in that resurrection, that Jesus Christ died. He died for our sins. His blood was shed. Shed for our sins. So that we can be cleansed, pardoned, purged, purified, saved, made righteous. And then it's by that resurrection we are begotten again unto a lively home. I need to emphasize that. Because you know sometimes you ask people, are you born again? Yes, I'm born again. How do you know you are born again? I believe in Jesus. What do you believe about Jesus? Well, I believe that, you know, he was you know, a great, great man of God. And then he went about doing good and healing all that oppressed of the devil. And I believe that he can heal the sick today. I believe that I can provide for all my wants and all my needs today. I believe in Jesus. I'm born again. It's not what you believe about healing that gets you born again. Look at that verse again. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again, we are born again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Verse 41, inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. That is, who are kept away from sin. Kept from sinning. You're kept away from rebellion and disobedience. You're kept away from an unrighteous life, a defiled life, an impure life. And it's the power of the blood shed for you on the cross of Calvary that keeps you away from that sinning. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You have seen the wonders of our justification. Isn't that resurrection of Jesus? You have seen the wonders of our sanctification. It's in the uh, resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have seen the wonders of our glorification. Everything made available and made real in our lives by the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we know him and the power of his resurrection, then we shall live according to the working of that mighty power, the power that worketh in us, and we'll be able to live the righteous life in Jesus' name. And it is as we believe that, that resurrection of Jesus Christ will be ready for the rapture. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 14. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, if we believe that, not just that if we believe that Jesus went about doing good, no, beyond that. Not if we believe that Jesus healed the sick, go beyond that. If we believe that Jesus can heal my sick body, it's beyond that. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Your participation in the rapture is hinged on the fact that you believe that Jesus died and he rose again. For this was sent to you by the word of the Lord. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or hinder precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's if you believe in his resurrection. Then it says, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever forever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another. That's one another if you are saved, if you are born again, if you are saved and purified, holy, if you have this hope in you and you are purifying yourself every day and every moment, even as he is pure, then we can bring this comfort to you. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I pray that that comfort will be for every one of us. 
are coming back to First Thessalonians chapter one, chapter one, verse ten. Third, third point now: watchfulness and deliverance from impending wrath. Watchfulness and deliverance from impending wrath. We're looking at that verse ten again, and it says, "And to wait, and to wait." Who are these people that were waiting? Not sinners. Sinners are not waiting. Not backsliders. Backsliders are not waiting. Because if they wait, are they going to see the Lord? Don't you remember the parable of the ten virgins? Five were wise and five were foolish. And the foolish took their lands, but they didn't have enough oil, enough grace to make them keep on living righteousness until the midnight cry. And then as their lands were going out, they talked to the other people and they had the sound. That now the bridegroom is coming. Lend us some oil. They said, no, let's it be not sufficient for you and us. Go and buy. You know where to get it. You should have repented long ago. You didn't repent. You have been righteous long ago. You, didn't, you are not righteous. All the decisions you have made, we cannot do it for you. It's getting too late. Go hurry up and do it. And then while they went, the door was shut. They were disappointed. I pray you'll not be disappointed. This is a time to get ready. This is the time to get saved. This is the time to be righteous. This is the time to be pure, to be holy. This is the time to be sanctified. Don't delay till tomorrow because you don't know when the Lord will come. These Thessalonian believers were waiting. And were waiting expectantly. Expecting that to happen any time and to wait for his son from heaven. Whom he raised from the dead. Even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come. Even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. That wrath to come is talking about the indignation. It's talking about the judgment. It's talking about the fury. It's talking about the punishment. It's talking about the perdition, which will come upon the ungodly, upon the guilty, those who have not repented. Christ has delivered all who believe in him from that wrath by taking our place and dying in our stead. And because we're told in John chapter 3, verse 36, he that believeth on the Son with repentance, with a dedication of his life to the Lord, oh Lord, if you save me, I'll not continue that bad thing anymore. Those are the people that have everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ bore and endured the wrath of God against our sins when he died for us on the cross of Calvary. Through faith in him, we have the value of his, of his redemptive work. Reckon to our account. We are delivered from the wrath to come. He also delivers us from the coming period of judgment when the wrath of God will be poured upon the world during the great tribulation. The wrath to come is real. And all who desire to escape the dreaded suffering must flee from that wrath to come. Becoming true believers, abiding in Christ with those who, fled, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. I pray you'll be among the number. Uh, look at Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, what it means to flee from that wrath to come. To be free from that indignation, that punishment, that perdition, that judgment coming upon the unbelievers. Luke chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 7. Luke chapter 3, verse 7. Here's what it says. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come. You must flee. It's not just that you stay there and say, well, God, if you want to save me, God, if you want, since Jesus died for me, I want to be saved. Do it at your own time. You flee. Just like the angels told Lord and the two daughters, and the wife, that they should flee to the mountain, run away out of that sin, separate from that sin, separate from that sinful life partner that they talk about, girlfriend, boyfriend, boy enemy, girl enemy, that's going to plunge you into eternal hell and into a lake of fire, run away and flee. So that as you separate yourself from every form of sin, 
the mercy of God will come upon you in Jesus' name. And then when you flee, as the evidence that you are fleeing, that you have gone away from that evil sin, immoral sin, licentious sin, and defiling sin. Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able to these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruits is cut down, hewn down, and cast into the fire. And the people are saying, What shall we do then? And he answered and said unto them, He that has two coats, let him impart to him that has none. And he that has meat, let him do likewise. It says, Let all the stinginess get away from you and show that there's a change, there's a transformation by the action, by the, by the life that you live now. And then it says, And then came also the publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said, Exact no more than that is appointed. Let the being born again, your salvation, your conversion, let it affect your action, your attitude, your interaction with people, your relationship with people. Verse 14, and the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, What shall we, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man. That is, you've been trained to be violent. You know, you have to repent of that and you have to get away from that if you're going to make it and if you're going to flee from the wrath to come, do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely and be content with your wages. Let covetousness go and then have the Lord, the Lord of glory now reigning in your life. Romans chapter 1, we're looking at it from verse 18. Romans chapter 1, verse 18, flee from the wrath to come waiting for the coming of the Lord who has delivered us from the wrath to come. We're looking at Romans chapter 1 verse 18. In verse 18 for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And those who still remain in ungodliness, unrighteousness of men, in the pollutions and the perversion of society, everybody is doing it. Everybody is giving bribe. Everybody is taking bribe. Everybody is doing evil. Everybody is cheating on the job. Everybody is cheating in exam. And because everybody is doing it, the unrighteousness and godliness of men, if you do it to them, the wrath to come will catch up with you. But if you're going to be ready for the coming of the Lord, and it can come anytime, you repent, you turn away from sin, because it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. There are some people that come here for Bible study. There are some people that come here for worship. And they have heard the truth over and over for many, many years. And they are holding the truth in unrighteousness. And then you are wondering, the man is always coming to the Bible study. And he's still committing secret fornication adultery with somebody else's wife. And he's coming to, and he will never miss Bible study. Holding the truth in unrighteousness. And the child that was born in the church, from primary school, I've been going to children's church. And secondary school, I've been going to the youth, the fellowship. And yet when it explodes, when it comes, still taking part in that evil scene, holding the truth in our righteousness. Ask him, ask her, any doctrine of the Bible. They open the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, they know it. They know the truth. They're not born again. Holding the truth in our righteousness. And those people, when the Lord shall come, they'll be surprised, they'll be disappointed. I pray you'll not be among them. That those who are backsliding, they remain in that backsliding, but they keep on coming to church, and they'll never miss Bible study, they'll never miss the fellowship, and they have all this talk of outlines in their homes, in their, in their places, and they know the scriptures, they know it in their head, it's not in their heart. And they hold the truth in our righteousness. And when the rapture will take place, they'll be surprised. Those are the people ever learning 
and ever able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I pray you'll not be among them. Verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder. They commit abortion and they come to a church like this. And they, they're in the Bible study every time. Abortion. Husband and wife are green. We cannot have another child now. And they're killing, murdering innocent babies. Debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They even encourage, they aid, and abet those people that do that same thing. I pray you'll not be among that number. Let's come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 9. For God has not appointed us to wrath. If anybody perishes, that's not the will of God. That's of his own making. That's because of his own carelessness. That's because of not wanting to repent. That's because of hardening his heart. That's because of just shrugging his shoulder. I don't care. If anybody gets into that wrath which is to come, it's not because God is not merciful. It's because he heard and he said, I don't care. I don't worry. It doesn't, doesn't matter. I'll take whatever comes and then you'll take hell forever. For God has not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, verse 10, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Talk to one another. You see a backslider. Don't just say, bro, sister. You're calling them bro, and then you're encouraging them. You know they're backsliders. Mr. So-and-so, when are you coming back to the Lord? Miss So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so. Then it will shock them. Then they will know that you know that they're backsliders. You're not talking behind them. You're showing that you are really eager, passionate, that they should come back to the Lord. And then those who are believers who are facing persecution, pressure and pain in their homes, in their places of work, you're talking to them, you're saying, endure, endure. You're encouraging one another, admonishing one another so that nobody will be careless and nobody will perish. You are kind of moving one another on to remain steadfast in the Lord. Not just that you are talking about, have you got a land? Have you got another house? Are you built? How about your marriage? Invite me when you're going to do the marriage. Have you got a child now? How many children have you? Stop all that. The important thing, that people should be pure and holy and sanctified, ready and prepared for heaven. And then you are encouraging one another, saying, have you done your restitution? Are you ready for the coming of the Lord? Are you watching when the Lord shall come? It says, you edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them that labor among you and, over, and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. you. You encourage members of the church, members of your house fellowship to respect our leaders, those who are laboring over us, preaching the word. And you don't, you don't want to allow all these uh, young people who are not born again coming in and wanting rebellion and disobedience to be the order of the day in the church, making other people that were standing to fall. You don't want to encourage that. You're telling them and admonishing one another to remember the people that labor over you and over you in the Lord and, admon and, to, est and to esteem them very highly. Not just esteem them, you esteem them highly. Not just highly, very highly in love for their work's sake. 
and be at peace among yourselves. You're encouraging one another. You're speaking to one another that there'll be peace. There'll be understanding. There'll be unity. There'll be kind of togetherness, oneness among the people of God. That's what you're doing if you're getting ready for the rapture. If you're going to escape the wrath to come. Now we exhort you, brethren, one them that are unruly. One them. Don't clap for them. Want them, don't encourage them in sinning, in evil. Want them that are unruly, comfort the feeble minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil, the spirit of retaliation that is capturing lives. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good. Both among yourselves and to all men, rejoice evermore, even when you're persecuted, when you're going through some deep waters, when the flame, the floor, the fire is there, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. Don't murmur, don't complain, make your request known unto God. In everything, give thanks, like Paul and Silas sang in the Philippian jail. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. This ought to be ready for the rapture. Quench not the spirit. Stop not the spirit. The spirit of revival. The spirit of supplication. The spirit of power. The spirit that leads us to come to the Lord and become more righteous and say, Lord, wash me, cleanse me, purge me, purify me, blot out all my transgressions, make me live a clean life. That kind of spirit that makes us to want to live a righteous life through and through. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesies. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from what? Tell me out loud. Uh, those are serious-minded believers who are getting ready for the rapture. They're looking at their lives. They're checking out their lives. If it's an appearance of evil, I don't want to get involved with that. A friend is doing it. I'm sorry. You're not going to be my friend if you continue in that. You're not going to get me to go with you in, the, in that invitation. If you continue in that, abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless, holy, pure, sanctified unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can the Lord do it? Faithful is see that calleth you who also will do it. He will do it. He can do it now. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. That the Lord will look on you with mercy, with compassion, with love, favorably. And accomplish this in your life. Check up your life. We're not talking about healing now. We're not talking about success now. We're not talking about religion now. We're talking about being ready when the Lord shall come. Ready when he will come. Take salvation, and whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For the seed, a seed remains, abides in him, and he cannot sin, he will not sin because he's born of God. Every man, every boy, every girl, every brother, every sister that has this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure don't get into a danger of religion 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 too much religion in the world no righteousness salvation being born again cleansed from sin purged from sin a new creature in Christ. Old things pass away. All things becoming new. Saved. Sanctified. Purified. 
made holy. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Blessed are the pure in heart. Not only the pure in the body, pure in clothing, pure in Christian dressing, pure in what you think is believers, your style, pure externally, the whitewashed Pharisees. Blessed are the pure in heart, pure thoughts, pure attitude, pure disposition, pure conduct, pure character, saved, sanctified, made holy, purified within. Those are the people that have fled from the wrath to come. Are you born again? You are born in the church, in this church. Have you repented? Have you given up sinning? Have you been cleansed and washed in the blood of the Lamb? You know the truth? You know the doctrine? You know the Bible verses? Are you holding the truth in unrighteousness? Your guilt and condemnation will be greater than the people that do not know the truth. He that knows the Lord's will, the Master's will, and doeth it not, shall be beaten with many stripes. And yet he that knoweth it not shall still be beaten with few stripes. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Give yourself to the Lord. This is the day of repentance, is the day of salvation. Is a day of cleansing with the blood of the Lamb. He can forgive you. He can pardon you. He can save you. Repent before it's too late. Be cleansed before it's too late. Be purified, purged, made righteous, made holy. Before it's too late. Turn away from that secret sin. Before it's too late. Plead for the mercy of the Lord. Before it's too late. Follow peace with all men. Follow peace with your husband. Peace with your wife. Peace with your parents. Follow peace with your children. Follow peace with your co-workers, landlord, co-tenants. Repent of that violence and fighting spirit. Follow peace with all men and holiness. Without which, no man, no woman, no boy, no girl, without holiness, no one shall see the Lord. Examine yourself. Examine your heart. Examine your life. Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you believed that he died for your sin? Have you believed that he rose again from the dead for your justification? Yes, Lord, I believe you died for me. 
Yes, Lord, I believe you rose again for my justification. Not just believing that he heals the sick. That doesn't take you to heaven. Not just believing he can take the oppression away. That's good, but doesn't take you to heaven. I believe he'll give me a wife. That doesn't take you to heaven. I believe he'll give me a good husband. That doesn't take you to heaven. I believe he'll give me success. That doesn't take you to heaven. I believe he died for me on the cross of Calvary to take my sins away. I believe that he rose again for my justification, for my salvation. I believe by the power of his resurrection, he comes to live in me, to live the victorious life. That's what brings salvation. That's what brings Christian experience to your life. I believe that his blood can make me whiter than snow. Cleanse me. Purge me. Wash me. Purify me. Make me holy. I believe because he died. I believe because he rose again. He can sanctify me. He can make me holy. Purge. Purify me. And make me to live consistently. The real, real, real Christian life. I believe he will not allow me to remain defeated, overcome with my sin, any inbred sin, secret sin. I believe he will give me inward victory, outward victory, in the private, in the public, everywhere, anywhere. He'll maintain the victory in my life. Because he died. And because he rose again. For my salvation. For my sanctification. For my steadfastness. My readiness. For the coming of the Lord. Believe. This very moment. And the spirit of God will be a testimony witness in your heart. That your sins are washed away. That your life is turned around. That that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. He gives it to you as a gift. And you go back home demonstrating it. Living victoriously. No more hypocrisy. No more cover up. No more insincerity. No more private sinning. Talk to the Lord. Have faith. This is the faith that matters. Repentance from sin, turning away from sin. And then having faith in the Lord. The faith that makes you to claim the promise of pardon. The promise of salvation. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And this is that day. The day of salvation. This is that moment. The moment of salvation. That if thou shalt believe in thine heart. That God the Father raised up Jesus Christ from the dead. Believe in your heart. Confess it with your mouth. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart you believe unto righteousness. And with your mouth you confess unto salvation. The present day reality of salvation. Cleansing. Purging. Purifying. Of that salvation, there's also sanctification, holiness of heart, purity of heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see the Lord. Lord, who shall ascend unto your holy hill, who will abide 
in heaven with you. They that have clean hands and a pure heart. They that have clean hands, salvation. No stealing, clean hands. No fornication, clean hands. No defilement, clean hands. No impurity, clean hands. In the day, in the night, clean hands. The private in the public, clean hands. It does have clean hands and a pure heart. Pure heart, sanctified heart, purged, purified. Sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean. From your, all your idols, from all your defilement, will I cleanse you. And I'll take the stony heart out of your heart. Give you a heart of flesh, soft, tender, loving, obedient, responsive, sensitive to the Spirit of God. Let him do it. And flee from the wrath to come. Don't say burning house and remain there. Flee from hellfire. Don't see judgment coming like a rushing mighty wind and then stay there. Flee from the wrath to come. Be ready, be prepared for the coming of the Lord. Admonish one another. Encourage one another to be saved. Instruct, teach, encourage, inspire, backslide us to repent, to come to the Lord. Encourage believers to remain steadfast and movable, standing for the truth. Encourage children to honor their parents. Encourage believers to esteem very highly. Leaders, pastors, overseers who are laboring over us in the way of the Lord, teaching us the word of God. Encourage believers to be obedient to the leaders who are teaching us the word of God, watching over our souls as they that must give account. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Consecrate yourself to the Lord so that the Lord will sanctify you wholly, spirit, soul, and body, preserved, blameless, day after day, moment after moment, blameless, holy, spotless, righteous, until the coming of the Lord. Faithful is he who has called you, who also will do it. Believe and be saved. Believe and be sanctified.